Are you okay? Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. And I think I'm sharing my slides with you. Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Ryoki Fukushima from Kyoto University. We'll talk about geometry of random walk range conditions on survival among Bernoulli obstacles. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Aviator, and uh, thanks for all the, all the organizers for inviting me for this seminar. And already in my first slide, I made a mistake. I changed my university, my institution from April. So I'm from Tsukuba University now. <laughs> so this is my old institute. I'm from University of Tsukuba. So I'm going to tell you about some annealed results, uh, which, you know, Chanji talked about. And of course, this is uh, based on joint work with Jandin, Rokensun, and Chanji Shu. So, uh, oh, it doesn't move. Okay. So the setting is essentially the same as Chanji's talk, but sometimes I, I'm sorry, we didn't try to consolidate notations. So there are some inconsistencies in notations, but uh, the model is the same. So we have this uh, simple random walk S on the D, which is starting at some point X. And mostly it is starting from uh, the origin. And then there, there is a traps, which is denoted by omega. And this is just independent Bernoulli omega, uh, sorry, Bernoulli T. And by using this independent Bernoulli, we define a set of obstacles as a site percolation cluster or a complement of site percolation cluster. And the random walk is killed when it hits this obstacle set. And for this heating time, I use this tau sub O notation instead of tau in Chanji's talk. And uh, okay, already Chanji explained a bit about a new result, but the question is how this random walk behaves uh, conditionally on the long time survival. So conditioned on the event where heating time to the obstacles is bigger than n. And we are interested in the case where n is large. But in this talk, we are interested in this annealed measure where average is taken also over the environment. So it is not only the random walk which moves uh, randomly, but also this uh, obstacles configuration can move. I mean, we can play with this obstacles configuration and it's also have some distribution. So more precisely, we are interested in the behavior uh, I mean, the joint behavior of random walk and obstacle distributions, right? And this is called a new draw because average is taken over the environment. And in particular, uh, what we are most interested in in this talk is the range of the random walk, behave as a range of the random walk under the annealed measure, which I denote by S sub zero N. This is a set notation. And this range is actually, in a sense, intrinsic to our unable measure in the following sense. So if you look at this event, uh, the survival time, hitting time is bigger than N, then this is exactly equivalent to uh, the second event here, that is random walk range doesn't contain any obstacles. And if you look at this event, uh, you, you can easily compute this probability. This probability is exactly P to the cardinality of the range. So this is just P to the cardinality of the range. And by using this expression, we can actually integrate out the obstacles marginal. Then we end up with this uh, random walk marginal. Random walk marginal is just expected by, this is random walk expectation uh, of P to the range of the random walk, and which is divided by this expectation. And this P is something less than one, so maybe it's better to rewrite it uh, in this way. All right, you can write it as E to the minus nu. Nu is log of one over P. Then you see this, this measure looks pretty much like a Gibbs measure on the path space. And the weight is given by minus nu, times the cardinality of the range. And by this computation, if you look at random walk marginal under this annealed measure, 
It can be regarded as some sort of self-attractive polymer model. Because if you have large random walk range, then it, it will give us some penalty here. So this has an effect to make uh, random walk range small. Okay, then uh, I start with some earlier works before I was. So the first result I would like to mention is uh, the, the classical result by Donska and Varadan, which Chanji already mentioned. And they computed uh, the partition function, so to speak. So what they computed is the reading of the asymptotics of the survival probability. And of course, if you look at their paper, they computed the Laplace transform of the range of the random walk. So you don't see any obstacles in the paper, but essentially what they computed is this survival probability. And what they got is the following. So this survival probability behaves like stretched exponentially with n to the d over d plus two power. Now, uh, remember that uh, if you look at the typical behavior of the random walk range, then it grows in a linear speed, at least in dimension three and higher. So if you simply substitute the expected behavior here, then you, you should get exponential decay. But in contrast, here you have stretch exponential decay. So there is already, you see something strange going on. And of course, you shouldn't be surprised. It's a, it's a large deviation behavior. If you compute this kind of very rare event, then most likely this kind of event is supported by some large deviation event. And I will tell you a bit more detail in the next slide. And here uh, there is a constant C, which depends on D and P, which have this variational expression. And in my talk here, it's the first inconsistency. This lambda U is not the eigenvalue of uh, transition matrix, but this is the eigenvalue of the generator, which is minus one over two D times the Laplacian. So it's a negative quantity and it appears on the top of exponential always. But anyway, if you look at this variational expression, it contains the volume of U, which of course is coming from the expression in the previous slide, and this uh, Dirichlet principal eigenvalue of Laplacian. And then there is uh, the famous Faber-Grand inequality, isoperimetric inequality, which tells us that if you fix the volume of a set, then it is a ball which minimizes uh, the, the Dirichlet principal eigenvalue. So if you look at this variational program, you can immediately focus on the ball. And then it's, it's just a one dimensional variational program and you can solve it actually by using a fast zero Bessel function. So in any case, it, it looks a bit complicated, but you can actually even compute the value of this CDP. And as I said, it, this, uh, this infimum is achieved by a ball. And the, the radius of that ball, I will denote by rho sub one of dp. Okay. Then uh, I will tell you how they got this expression because it's, it, it's important to understand our result or maybe okay. even other earlier studies. Can, so can, I, can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. So don't you already get the, the, um, uh, the raw, the uh, diameter of, of U uh, according to the variational problem? Because uh, you have the natural scaling of the volume versus the eigenvalue, right? So you're supposed to already get the the diameter or, or n long? Uh, you mean here? Uh, yes. You mean depending on n? Or? So, so what is the, what is the, uh, the what is the diameter of the infimizer? Can't you get it uh, by, by this? Uh, the function the diameter is this row one. Right, this variational program, mm -hmm. this doesn't depend on n. Already, uh, I, I did some scaling already. And for the scale, I will tell you in the next slide. Okay, it will be n to the one over d plus two. But this I will tell you in the next slide, okay? 
All right, so uh, I will tell you how the argument goes. Of course, I cannot explain everything, but it's uh, here is a very schematic argument. So you look at this survival probability here, then uh, you can, of course, write it as this huge sum. You sum over all the possible shapes of a random walk range. It's a really a huge sum, exponentially a huge sum. So it, it looks useless, but it will be useful. And then once you fix this shape u, random walk range uh, takes this fixed shape u, then of course what you need is this shape u is uh, obstacle free. And what is this probability? This obstacle probability is of course just p to the cardinality of u. And for this random walk part, essentially you are asking the random walk to stay in some region. So this probability is controlled by the first uh, eigenvalue of Laplacian, like this. And here, this exponential term, of course, decays exponentially in n, especially if u is small. On the other hand, this p to the cardinality u term also uh, decays in u, I mean, in the cardinality of u exponentially fast. So if you make u very large, then you lose a lot from this p to the u term, but on the other hand, you gain something in this exponential term. So there will be some balancing between uh, this principal eigenvalue and the volume. And because both terms are exponentially decaying, if you know Laplace principle, uh, it, it's, it's virtually infinite dimensional space, but still it's reasonable to believe that this huge sum is supported by only by a few maximizers. And this is exactly what Donska and Varadam proved by using the large deviation principle. Large deviation principle gives you a way to prove some Laplace principle in the infinite dimensional space. So this double tilde is a kind of Laplace principle. And once you get it, then uh, here u is fixed, but here n is going to infinity. So of course you have to scale the size of u and the right scaling is n to the one over d plus two. Because if you scale u in the size n to the one over d plus two, then you get n to the d over d plus two from this volume term. And then this uh, principal eigenvalues, this one scales like one over diameter squared. So if you take n to the one over d plus two and you compute a little bit that, then you also get d n to the d over d plus two from this term. So this gives you uh, the right scale. And as I said, Donska Varadam proved it by large deviation. And there is, if you want, there is another argument by Schnittmann. Actually, in the discrete setting, it is carried out by Schnittmann student Antal. And that is called the method of enlargement of obstacles. And this method is very complicated. So I'm not going to tell you about it. But anyway, if you look at this argument, there is a survival probability which is in principle a huge sum over uh, all the possible strategies. But conclusion is that this survival probability, probability is supported by uh, very few events or even only one event, which is best among others. So this proof indicates that the best strategy that is to stay in the ball of this radius, rho one times n to the one over d plus two, uh, dominates all the other strategies, actually the sum of all the other strategies. And if you look at this kind of situation, then, uh, it, it, and then you move to uh, the Gibbs measure or conditional measure, uh, then it's natural to believe that under the Gibbs measure, you see this best strategy only. All the other strategies are much less efficient, so you will not see it and as a conditional measure. And this indication has been made rigorous by Schnittmann d equal to in the continuum setting, Brothausen, again, two dimension, but discrete setting. And finally, Pobre proved it in general dimensions in the following uh, form. So they proved that for any d greater than or equal to two, there is a, some random center of the ball, which I denote by xn, such that this random walk range is completely contained in the ball at center xn and with radius rho n plus something small. This probability go to one. 
This already says that uh, the best strategy dominates all the others. But actually, this is this result is a little bit stronger, or actually much stronger, I guess, than what Donskard Baradan's argument indicates. Why? Because See, Donska Baradan's proof is based on a large deviation principle. And more precisely, large deviation principle for the empirical measure of the Markov process. So what, what you can actually read from Donska Baradan's result is that the random walk spent almost all the time in the ball. But of course, that is not enough to exclude uh, small excursions going outside. So it's not trivial at all, and it takes, you see, it takes uh, 12 years from Don Skabarodan to Schmittmann. And if you look at Wiener Sausage, it takes 16 years, and it's reasonable. It's very far away from what Don Skabarodan indicated. So roughly speaking, it's, it's, it's from L1 to L infinity. You have some L1 control, and then you, you want to exclude everything. And uh, for example, Bolthausen explained that nicely in his lecture not in mathematics article. And there he wrote, it is not clear if one really should believe in this confinement and had in fact been doubted by experts in the beginning. So it's really a non-trivial problem. But this, this, this very nice localization is already proved by these people. And here is a schematic figure of confinement. It's, uh, it's not complete at all. And actually it's misreading in the sense that if you look at the volume of this ball, it's, it's sublinear in N. The volume is N to the D over D plus two. So the number of steps of random walk is much more than the volume. So almost all the points inside the ball is visited actually many times. You expect that almost all the site is visited by N to the two over D plus two times. So this board should be almost completely filled. And that you, you can actually prove by Don Scavaradan result. But again, what you cannot prove is that there are some, there might be some obstacles and these are much harder to exclude. Or in terms of random oak range, you can prove that random oak range almost covers the ball, but it's much harder to prove if it's completely cover the ball or not. And that ball covering property or ball clearing property are proved only in dimension two before, before our work. So uh, in 1991, Schnittmann already proved that in the two dimensional case, uh, there is no obstacles in a slightly smaller ball with high probability. And in uh, 1994 by Bolthausen, he proved that even stronger, the random walk completely contain this uh, slightly smaller ball. If the random walk range contained a smaller ball, then there shouldn't be any obstacles inside. So this, this is slightly stronger than Schintman's work, Schintman's result. But uh, somehow the Schintman described this result as a kind of side remark or a small corollary to his analysis. But in, in Bolthausen's paper, this, this part, this proposition is a bit more significant. In the sense that both has actually used this covering property as a first step to his proof of confinement property. And therefore he stated uh, the extension of this to D greater than or equal to three as a conjecture. And here is our first main result, uh, which simply proves uh, that Bolthausen's conjecture is right. So for any d greater than or equal to two and this rho n uh, in the scale n to the one over d plus two and this xn is the same as confinement property. Then uh, there is some small epsilon. No, no, sorry, this is not necessarily small. There is some epsilon. Why this ball is completely contained the range of the random walk with high probability. So it looks satisfactory, <laughs> but there is a small remark. As I said, this confirms Bolthausen's conjecture, 
But at least in this uh, 2018 paper, which uh, in this year appeared in PTRF, uh, our proof relies on the confinement property. We use the confinement property as the input. So maybe this solution is not completely satisfactory to the Bothausen because this doesn't complete his program of proving confinement property. Later, we managed to do it, but at least in the, in the first paper, we assumed it. And uh, almost at the same time as our preprint uh, for this, this, this theorem, uh, Nathaniel Brestiki and Raphael Saf announced the proof of ball covering without assuming confinement. So the Bolthausen's program is essentially carried out by other people. And the argument is completely different from ours. They rely on large deviation techniques. And our proof, as, a Chan, as Chanji already mentioned, will rely more on the combinatorial switching argument, which I will tell you in more detail. Okay, and then here is our second main result that is about boundary size. So combining this confinement property and ball covering, okay, this is already uh, again mentioned by Chanji, <laughs> the boundary of the range is contained in this uh, quite thin annulus. And then, uh, of course, it is of interest to study boundary fluctuations. And I must say, this is just a small step toward understanding the surface fluctuation, but we got this bound. So if you look at the cardinality of the boundary of the range, then it's almost like a ball, except for this logarithmic factor. But uh, you see, I don't know how strong this estimate is. For example, if you don't combine this cardinality estimate with this confinement, I mean, localization between annulus, it doesn't say much. If the cardinality of boundary is this large, I mean, low n to the d minus one times log n, it can be much larger ball. <laughs> so it's, this cardinality estimate itself doesn't say much, but uh, with this annulus confinement property, it says something. At least it says that uh, Hausdorff dimension is not much larger than d minus one. Okay, so these are our, these are our results. And there is a small consequence on the partition function asymptotics. So there was this don't cover done asymptotics, but uh, okay, I didn't tell you anything about the confinement property, but uh, don't cover done asymptotics is not sharp enough to derive essentially anything about the Gibbs measure. And one of the problem is that this leading order term, n to the d over d plus two here, is in the volume scale. On the other hand, if you consider a confinement property type event, then everything is happening in a length scale. That is n to the one over d plus two. So for example, if you want the random walk to make an excursion of length n to the one over d plus two, this happens with probability exponential minus n to the one over d plus two which means that that probability is hidden in this, uh, this error term in the, in the don't cover done asymptotics. And actually it is because it is n to the one over d plus two, it is hidden, hidden in the deep higher order term. So typically the partition, exact form of partition function asymptotics is not that useful in the study of Gibbs measure, but in any case, the asymptotic expansion of the partition function is of interest. And in that direction, a physicist whose name is Lubensky used uh, some non-rigorous uh, field theoretic computation to derive this second order asymptotics. From mathematics side, this is still a conjecture. So he said that first order term is n to the d over d plus two and uh, the second order term is first of all, it's negative and there is some constant and this one is, sub is of surface order. But mathematically, uh, so far what has been known is the second term here is bounded from below by this one, minus some constant times n to the d minus one over d plus two. This you can compute. And for the upper bound, what has been known is just c2 times n to the d minus kappa divided by d plus two for some kappa between zero and one. So there is a gap in, uh, in the exponent. 
but once we get this, uh, uh, one, once we get our control on the size of the boundary, then in this sum, you write this uh, survival probability as this huge sum, we have a very good restriction on this uh, possible sets of U because there is a constraint on the volume and also constraint on the cardinality of the boundary size. So we can reduce this sum to very small sum. And actually we can get this slightly refined control where we have only n to the d minus one divided by d plus two and there is this logarithmic factor. This is of course a very small improvement. For example, we cannot say that there is a negative sign here, but still uh, at least we have matching order in the upper bound and lower bound. And I'm telling you this because it will appear in, in the end of the talk again. Okay, these are essentially our main results. Okay. And then uh, I'm going to tell you some proof ideas. So let me start with ball covering. And actually I'm only proving some, a weak version of ball covering, but uh, I think it is of interest. Now, our proof of all the theorems rely on comparison arguments, which already Chanji mentioned. And uh, just to, to, to start with, I'm telling you very small lemma, which illustrates uh, how we use it, which looks not very, maybe it looks mysterious and doesn't look very useful, but it will be a bit useful at least to your understanding. So here's a lemma, which essentially says that if we could prove that there is no obstacles in the ball, then we can immediately say that uh, the random walk range cover the smaller ball. So the pre precise statement is the following. Suppose that we have this bound, the probability that there is no, sorry, probability that there is an obstacle in this smaller ball decays like uh, small order rho n to the minus d. So I need some quantitative control. It's, it's not just saying this probability goes to zero, but some quantitative control. But once we have it, then we can immediately say that this smaller ball is covered by random walk. I think there are many ways to prove it, but here is our very simple argument. Suppose that there is a point Sorry, the probability that there is a point in this smaller ball, which is not covered by the random walk is positive. I mean, bounded from, uh, bounded away from zero. Then because there are only rho n to the d many points, uh, there must be some point x which satisfies this probability bound. So we take this existence out of this probability with the cost of this rho n to the minus d. But then if you look at this event, on this event, it really doesn't matter whether there is an obstacle at X or not. You can switch the event. So in total, uh, this left-hand side is bounded from above by this probability because it's essentially, you see, the, for this event, we can switch the uh, existence of uh, obstacle at X. So uh, maybe it's, uh, it's easier to think about uh, the case where P is equal to one half. If P is equal to one half, everything is just uniform. So everything is de determined by cardinality of uh, events. How many configurations we have, which satisfies this event. And if there is this event, then exactly half of that configuration satisfies the event in the next line. So they are comparable. But if you look at this, this part is exactly the probability that we know decays, I mean, we assumed decays faster than rho n to the minus t. So there is a contradiction. So this, this is a simple proof that clear link with quantitative control in price ball covering. And it's a, it's a very simple instance how to use comparison argument. 
You see, in this argument, there is no partition function appears. It's just a comparison. Now let's move on. So because of this, uh, this lemma, I mean the previous lemma, what we have to prove is that there is no obstacles in the slightly smaller ball with probability close to one. I need some quantitative control, but it's, it's almost always comes for free. So I, I, I will write it in a slightly loose way. Now let's suppose that there is an obstacle in this slightly smaller ball. Then there are small, uh, two possibilities. We focus on this uh, small ball. It is still of size rho n, so it's macroscopic, but I have this uh, small factor epsilon here. So we look at the, uh, here is a confinement ball and I look at small neighborhood of x. And there are two possibilities. In this small ball, the first case is that in this small ball, the density of obstacles is bigger than delta. Delta is just a small fixed constant. Or in this small ball, the density of obstacle is small. It's just a very simple case distinction. And this case one, and this is very easy to exclude because if there is a, this, this ball is small, but still it is of size of order rho n. So if there is a delta density of obstacles, then we lose some volume, which means that we are already uh, away from Donska Varadan optimal solution. There is a deviation in the volume. So we are away from uh, the optimal uh, infimum of the variational program. So this first case, because there are too many obstacles in this ball, it makes it too hard for the random walk to survive. So this is very easy to exclude. And actually this you can make by comparing to the partition function. This is the only place we can do it with partition function. And it is, a, this, it is this second case, which is very hard. If there are a small number of obstacles, then it doesn't affect the survival probability of the random walk. So this is much harder. And it is more complicated. And actually, we split this case two into two subcases. And the first case, uh, oops, case two, 2.1, is a case where random walk comes close to x many times. More precisely, random walk visit, visit this, this ball, epsilon rho n half ball, many times. I don't make precise what I mean by many times, but uh, there are some quantitative control. And then the second case is random walk come close to x only a few times. Again, this is just a simple case distinction. And then we are going to deal with these two cases by using different uh, comparison arguments. So let's start with case 2.1. So here is just a reminder. Uh, we assume that this small ball contains a small fraction of obstacles and random walk comes close to X many times. And in this situation, what we do is the following. We do this uh, operation. We remove all the obstacles in this ball. And this operation, of course, imposes a cost in environment probability. If you allow the obstacles to be inside the ball, then there, there of course will be more configurations. And if we get rid of everything, we lose some entropy uh, in the obstacles configuration. But because we assume that there is a small density, there is only small density of obstacles, we don't lose too much. There is some entropy control. We lose something, but not too much. And on the other hand, if we remove obstacles in this ball, we gain something in random walk survival probability. And this gain in the random walk survival probability is actually large because in this case, we assume that random walk comes back to this ball many times. And if you compute, <laughs> I mean, if you define this many times and small density properly, and if you compute, then it turns out that this gain in the random walk probability beats the cost in the environment probability. So in this way, we can prove that this probability of case 2.1 is much smaller than another probability that is random walk survives and there is no obstacles in this ball. So in particular, there shouldn't be an obstacle at X. So 
So this we call a switching argument. We start from some unfavorable event and we do some operation. In some part, we gain something and in some part we lose something, but in the end, we end up with some other event. And we just say that our, the probability of bad event is much smaller than other probability of other event. And in the end, once we get this, this inequality, we divide both sides by partition function to get the same relation for Gibbs measure. So again, here we are not using any asymptotics to the partition function. But this operation, I mean, the computation of gain and cost, cost is easy, but the gain is not, uh, not straightforward because the cost in the environment increases linearly in the number of obstacles. If you want to remove k obstacles, then you have to pay p to the k cost. So it's exponentially in the number of obstacles, but the gain does not increase linearly. So the picture is like this. You have this big ball, there are only few obstacles, but around the X, there might be some obstacles and there might be some cluster formed by obstacles. And in this situation, of course, what matters for the random walk survivals is the obstacles which is on the boundary of, of this cluster. So you cannot expect that uh, removing uh, K obstacles increase uh, the survival probability by K, anything uh, proportional to K. So it is only the boundary that matters random walk survival. And in fact, it is even worse. If you know a bit about perturbation theory of this kind of singular perturbation theory, actually what matters is the capacity and the capacity grows slower than the boundary size. So it's even worse. So we here we have to do something uh, quite complicated. So I'm not going to tell you in detail, but we have to select some obstacles from the cluster in such a way that it is enough to, I mean, these selected obstacles are still enough to control the gain in survival probability. And also we can control the entropy loss based on these, these, these things. So this approximation we call a skeletal approximation. And if we choose skeleton of obstacles in the right way, then we can make it. But uh, here the technicality is quite hard. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not hoping that you understand this part, but at least I just wanted to say it's not, uh, not straightforward. But I'm not telling you the detail because the other case is, uh, at least from my point of view, more interesting. At least uh, for me, it looks very unnatural. So uh, we are dealing with this case 2.2. What was that? In the case 2.2 was that this ball contains a small density of obstacles and the random walks comes close to X only a few times. And in this case, of course, we cannot gain the random walk uh, probability by removing obstacles. So we have to do something different. And here is what we do. First, we remove all, all the obstacles in this, in this annulus. So that is uh, these uh, five points in the left picture here. We remove all the obstacles in this annulus. Then we have to pay something to the obstacles configuration. And further, we let the random walk avoid this central ball. So we also have to pay something to the random walk. And therefore, so far, we only lose something, both in the environment probability and random walk probability. But once we do it, once we have done these two steps, then because random walk doesn't visit this central ball, in this central ball, gray ball, we can do whatever we want. So in particular, we throw many obstacles in this ball, or let me say, uh, we change the distribution of the obstacles in this ball into a typical distribution. Now, because we started with this small density of obstacles, we started with large deviation event and we switched to typical event. So we gain a huge amount from this last switching. So this imposes a cost in the random walk probability, but this is not too much because we assume that random walk comes close to X only a few times. 
And then for environment, first operation imposes a cost, but in the second operation, we gain a lot. And we can prove that again, gain beats the cost. So this probability of case 2.2 is much smaller than the probability that random walk avoid the obstacles, not only obstacles, but also this one quarter size ball up to time n. And the configuration in this ball is uh, typical. And therefore, if you divide both sides by partition function, then under Gibbs measure, this case 2.2 has a very small probability. OK. And this argument looks very unnatural. And actually, this is very wasteful. Because in the end of the argument, what we get is, is this event. And look at this event. In this event, because this obstacles configuration in this small ball is typical, so we are going back to case one. There is a large density of obstacles in this ball. And you know, this case could be excluded by just comparing with, uh, with partition function. So we are, we are comparing this case 2.2 to some event which plays only a very tiny part of partition function. So it looks very wasteful, but, but this is still more effective than comparing with the partition function. I mean, explicit form of the partition function. So this is a message. Always, it's not a good idea to compare with partition function. And even this wasteful argument is better than comparing to the, to the explicit form. OK, so uh, I think this is the end of my ball clearing proof. By using this case 2.2 and 2.1, uh, in both cases, it turns out it's better not to have an obstacle at x, and therefore there is no obstacles in a slightly smaller ball. Now let's move on to uh, the proof idea for the boundary size. This requires some more technicality, so I will be much more sketchy and tell you just some key ideas. But I think it's, it's interesting. So it's a bit complicated. I have to introduce a new notion, which we call truly open site. The random walk range is not very easy object to play with. For example, it's not easy to switch a given random walk range to another one, because it, it, it is coming from some trajectory of random walks. So local deformation is not easy. For the random walk range itself. So we, we want to approximate the random walk range by some set which depends on obstacles. And that we call truly open site. And here's a definition. You don't have to care about all these power of log and this exponential and so on. But roughly speaking, the truly open site is a site which is atypically safe for the random walk. So for example, if you have a typical configuration, then the probability is that you avoid uh, obstacles up to log n to the five time decays like here, exponential log n to the five. Because if you're in a typical situation, every second step, you have an obstacle. So it decays exponentially in time. So assuming that it decays only exponential log n to square means that it's atypically safe. It's very safe. And we write this uh, script T as a cluster of truly open site, which is inside the confinement bar, ball, but this is just a small technicality. And the uh, first remark I already mentioned, a truly open site is atypically safe. And second, uh, whether, this, whether a site X is truly open or not is a local event. It depends only on the log n to the five neighborhood. So this allows us to do some operations on a truly open site, which will be important for our argument. Now, by the definition of truly open sites, it's, it's, it's not easy, but it's not very hard to believe that these truly open sites approximate the random walk range. And the first fact says that random walk range is contained in this truly open site with probability close to one. 
And also we can say that random oak range contains any site in truly open, open set, which is uh, within log n to the three distance, uh, sorry, uh, distance bigger than log n to the three from the, the boundary. Let me give a bit more explanation. So the random walk should stay in a truly open site because it is a truly open site at safe site. In other words, not truly open sites are a dangerous part of the environment. So it's not it's better not to visit non truly open site. It's it's too simple. <laughs> it's it's too brief to explain, but uh, you can prove it. And the second part. This part is not so simple, but it's this is in a sense very similar to ball covering theorem. So if you look at the truly crust of truly open site, you know you pay something to make up a truly open site, truly open cluster. And if there is a cluster, you should visit it. You should visit everything because you already paid something. If you don't visit some truly open site, then you don't have to make it truly open site by paying some cost. So you can switch it back to a typical site. So if there is a truly open site, then it should be visited essentially. So that is the intuition behind this second fact. And if you combine these two facts, then you can derive that derive the third one here. The boundary is contained in the log n to the three neighborhood, some neighborhood of uh, the boundary of truly open sites. Okay, this part is anyway very sketchy, so I, I just want you to grasp some some intuition. And if you admit this, then everything is boils down to controlling the boundary size of truly open site, not the boundary size of the random oak range. So we want to prove that this boundary of t is bounded from above by rho n to the d minus one times some polylog. Now the intuition is the following. This boundary of truly open cluster should be rather smooth. Roughly, because if there is something like this, I'm drawing this outgoing finger. Of course, outgoing finger is not only situation where it is rough, but suppose that there is this outgoing finger. Then, because outside here is not truly open, random walk does not go into this finger. It's, it's too hard for the random walk. At least it, random walk has to pay some cost to go inside. And if you know that random walk doesn't visit this site, then uh, as in the previous slide, there is no point in paying a cost to keep this part truly open. So you can switch. And in more a bit detail, uh, okay, let me draw a picture first. So if there is this kind of random walk and uh, this outgoing finger in the truly open site, then you can simply switch the random walk. This costs a bit, but once you switch the random walk, then you can close this truly open site. Then you gain something. And in this way, you can exclude um, outgoing finger. Roughly speaking. And of course, it is not only outgoing finger, there might be some inward fingers and so on, and all these things we want to exclude. And now, or actually, uh, the actual argument goes as follows I want to define or quantify uh, the finger, or more precisely, we define some bad points on the boundary of truly open sites. And the definition goes as follows. A point x on the boundary is called bad when this probability hitting to, okay, let, let's make it simple, hitting to x before getting killed is bounded from above by this row n to the one minus d minus epsilon. This looks a bit complicated, but it is actually natural because if you are on a boundary of this truly open site, once you hit a boundary of truly open site, then it, almost immediately you will get killed. So you, in, in particular, it's very unlikely that you visit two points on the boundary of truly open cluster. 
Therefore, almost all the points on the boundary of three open cluster have almost, I mean, uniform probability to be hit, which is rho n to the one minus d. So for example, if it is really a ball, then all the points are visited with the probability rho n to the minus, sorry, one minus d. And then after hitting the boundary of the ball, it will be killed. And here there is this minus epsilon, extra minus epsilon makes it really a bad point. So the bad point on the truly boundary of T is a point which is on the boundary, but it's hard for the random walk to visit. And of course, a typical situation is here. It is on the, on the tips of uh, outward finger. And now if the random walk visit a bad point, then the argument is the same. Because it is bad, by switching the random walk to uh, inside, we gain something. Sorry, we lose something, but not too much. And then we can close, close this uh, truly open side. And therefore, there shouldn't be any bad point on the boundary. OK, I think I must be a little bit quick. Next slide is almost the last slide. <laughs> Now, uh, if you admit the argument in the previous slide, what we have proved is that there is no bad point. In other words, for any point on the boundary, in the probability that the random walk hits that point X before getting killed is bounded from below by low n to the minus, sorry, one minus D minus epsilon. Okay, this is just a restatement of the fact that there is no bad point. But on the other hand, once again, once you hit the boundary of truly open side, then you will almost uh, immediately get trapped. And by using that, you can prove that some of this probability is almost one. And actually it is bounded from above by log n to the C. Now, if you admit to these two bounds, then you can substitute this first bound into this sum, and you conclude that uh, the cardinality of the truly open side boundary is bounded from above by this row n to the d minus one plus epsilon. Epsilon is here. Now this gives us slightly weak version of boundary size control. You know, our main result has only polylogarithmic factor and here we lose polynomial factor. And so we have to bootstrap. And this part is very complicated, but the main philosophy is the following. Finally, now we have some control on the boundary size. It's not optimal, but some control. And then we can use this partial result to reduce the entropy in this huge sum. And by using this uh, reduce of the entropy, entropy, we can bootstrap to get the final result, which is the polylogarithmic. I'm sorry, I am afraid in the last part I was too quick, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? So, I, I have one. Uh, so uh, you show that the um, that you, you can get some restriction on the on the uh, boundary of the random walk, right? Yes. Now uh, we know that if you if you just take the Gibbs measure for random walk where, where you penalize a large boundary, you get a shape which is not a ball, mm -hmm. right? So, so do you expect that you uh, a similar shape here and here, or or indeed, I I don't know uh, I don't know because uh, okay that's a hard question you know I, I know you you worked uh, on that program with Marek Biskup and also mm -hmm. there is another work by Nathanael Bersticki and Yadi mm -hmm. yeah uh, there I think they I mean in 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 Bersticki Yadin paper they only computed partition function asymptotics and that are as far as I remember not sharp. Mm -hmm. And uh, from technical side, what I can tell you is that in our argument, you see there are many switching of obstacles. And that's a very important to our argument. And actually Berst the work by Bersticki and Saf, I mentioned in the, in the passing, 
was based on attractive polymer uh, interpretation. So they, they don't use any obstacle switching. Actually, they use a large deviation, refined large deviation estimate. But here we are using obstacle switching. And if you want to apply our method to your model, I mean, boundary generalization, you have to invent uh, obstacle interpretation of your model. Mm -hmm. Which is, I think, not impossible because you know what you need is a point process whose vacancy probability is controlled by uh, the boundary size, and that is what mm -hmm. you see in the easing model. So you have to work with a random walk killed by easing crust. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, I don't know. I haven't tried, but uh, you know it's it's. So that that is uh, my message. So you you have to introduce mm -hmm. that model, and then you have to study it. But then you lose independence. So switching argument yeah. doesn't work uh, like that. Mm -hmm. It's a hard oh, problem. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, then let's uh, thank uh, both our speakers of today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, Bye-bye. See you all uh, next week. Thank you. I hope he